Good morning. <laughs> Happy Sabbath. Um, the scripture reading is found in Revelations 19, 7 through 8. Let us rejoice and be happy and give, God, and give glory to God. Give God glory because the wedding of the Lamb has come and the Lamb's bride has made herself ready. Fine linen was queen to the bride for her to wear. The linen was bright and clean. The fine linen was mean. The God thing, the good things that God, holy people, did. Amen. Thank you, Kevin. Well, I, one thing I think I failed to do earlier, I know David did, was give you a welcome. I want to welcome you if you were. I know we've got a couple of several guests here today, so we're glad you have chose to worship here with us this morning. So thank you for that. And also saw a face or two that has been scarce since the COVID thing has uh, started. So we're glad to see you back this morning. And um, you know, today, as I mentioned during announcement time, we're going to begin what I'm calling the first of a two-part series. And I, I hesitate to call something that's only two parts a series because it is so brief. But nonetheless. Today is part one, and next Sabbath, Lord willing, we'll cover part two. And one of the things for me that's been on my mind a lot since this whole COVID pandemic is that uh, our church members, we have been so separated during this time. And of course, we've been meeting together again here in the church since June 6th, but we're still having to do the practice antisocial distancing and wearing these masks and all that. And so we still have very limited interactions with one another. And, and my fear as a pastor from day one of this has been that we become so accustomed and so comfortable with staying home and tuning in via the internet that when the restrictions are lifted, I am afraid that many people will have become so comfortable they're just going to say, I'm going to stay home and continue doing like I've been doing. And so thus, the name of this little series is called Some Assembly Required, and uh, it'll be more abundantly clear next week as I look at a different aspect, but, but I thought it'd be, it'd be good for us, and I know it would be appropriate for us to talk about the church, the bride of Christ. And, you know, for, for a lot of the things when you go out and buy, they may come in boxes or whatever it is, and, and there's a lot of things that there's some assembly required for you to be able to use them. And for a wedding to happen, which is what we're going to be talking about today, some things have to take place for that wedding to go smoothly. There has to be a lot of planning. There has to be a lot of preparation. A venue and a date has to be chosen. The guest list has to be made. A meal has to be planned. Uh, participants have to be notified, an official has to be informed and asked to perform the service, the honeymoon has to be arranged, the dresses and suits have to be purchased, and there's probably a lot of things as, as that have only been on one side of that that I'm not even aware of that has to take place to have a wedding. And so there's a lot of assembly that's required to have a wedding. And this week, what I want to focus on is for us, I want to focus on us as individuals and what that means to be the bride of Christ and how to be ready for the coming of the bridegroom and the wedding celebration. And next Sabbath, again, Lord willing, we're going to be expand our study and we're going to discuss the church corporately, all of us together, about the church, what it means, what the church is. And I'm still working on a lot of stuff. I've got so much information I want to share. But you know, when we're talking about a wedding, you know, you, you have to have a bride, right? You can't have a wedding without a bride. And so to begin with, I want to give you just a few facts about some of the wedding traditions that we have. If you've ever wondered why we call that finger our ring finger, uh, that is because it was once thought that the vein from this finger led directly to our hearts. And so that's why they started putting the finger, the ring on that finger. Uh, Queen Victoria, you know, we had the white wedding dresses that we wear. And Queen Victoria is credited with, credited with actually starting uh, this whole um, tradition in 1840. This is, in fact, a picture of the dress that she wore in 1840. This was the first white wedding dress. And so, you know, it was just a, she started it now. It's a, it's a tradition that, and millions and millions are made every year on selling these wedding dresses. 
Um, a third thing, if you ever heard about, you know, tying the knot, we call, we get married, we call it tying the knot. Well, that came in a lot of cultures around the world, the Celtic, Celtic, and Hindu, and Egyptian weddings. They literally tie the husband and the wife, the bride and the groom together in a symbol, a symbolic of their commitment to one another. And another thing that's, that's been a big part of our tradition is uh, this song, The Wedding March by Mendelssohn. And it's played if many, if not most, if not all of weddings that I've ever officiated. And, that, and so, but what you might not know about this song is that at least according to Wikipedia and actually several other sources, this Wedding March song was first used in 1850 in an opera and it was banned from use in churches for many years because it was a secular song. But now we play it in every wedding just about. But regardless, when you hear that song, when that song is played, you start looking for something. You start looking for a bride, right, to come down that aisle. That's what we look for. Let's pray. Father, this morning as we are about to open your word, um, we always need your spirit. But especially when we come together corporately like this, Satan is always in our midst trying to bring confusion or distraction. And so I just want to pray that um, your holy angels will, will guide and guard us and that your spirit will be present in a mighty way here as we uh, discuss the wedding garment, we discuss the wedding, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to thank Deborah Ito. We had her up here earlier for the for the wedding dress here. She, uh, you might remember, I sent an email out a month or so ago asking if anybody had a wedding dress that I could borrow. Well, Deborah was very quick on the draw, and she got me, a, in fact, brought it to the church there from the school, and. Um, you know, I also sent out this week, I think it was, I asked for a mannequin. So I want to thank Jamie and Lorena. I don't know if they're here or not, um, for loaning me this mannequin. And so I appreciate that very much. And of course, it's going to serve as an illustration today. But I, I, had, you, I had you look, I had Deborah come over here and stand by this thing. And, and you might have noticed it's kind of tall. And I thought, man, uh, you know, I hear when we get older, we kind of start to shrink. Now, I've only lost about a half inch in height. But Deborah, it seems, has come quite, quite significantly. So I don't know what's going on there. But maybe it's because she's a school teacher. I'm not sure about that. But, but anyway, Deborah, thank you very much for, for loaning me this wedding dress. Um, and I don't, I'm not going to say how many years ago you used it. So... Oh, well, 35. She doesn't mind saying, so I can, I can say it then. But, but anyway, um, I didn't ask Deborah what this dress cost her, but as of June of last year of 2019, the average cost of a wedding gown was $1,564 for a dress you wear one time, hopefully. Um, with that statistic in mind, on average, there are 44,000 marriages every weekend. Of course, that was pre-COVID, and I'm sure that's, that's settled down. There's probably less now. But statistically also, we're getting married less than we were before. In fact, marriage is losing ground in America. Statistics point out that how fewer and fewer people are getting married. And from this uh, article I found, it says, For the first time ever, this was March 2016, single adult women women outnumber married adult women in the United States. Wedding has got a bad rap a lot of times. I read about a, uh, an ad about for a, a wedding dress that was worded this way. It was in a newspaper, and it said, for sale wedding dress size 8 worn once by mistake. <clears throat> With that said, there's still uh, nothing quite like a wedding. For most of women love weddings. The first thing that you tell a woman about a wedding is coming. One of the first things they ask is, what am I going to wear? For us guys, it, at least many of us think, well, there goes a wasted Sunday afternoon. But the women get excited and about these things. And, um, you know, a lot of time, as I mentioned, a lot of time and energy and assembly goes in and expense into having a wedding. Um, and, and several times throughout Scripture, and I'll probably allude to some more next Sabbath, we find Christ referring to uh, His people using the symbolic language of a marriage and a marriage commitment. In fact, it's the grand theme that we find in the book of Revelation and how it concludes. If you would go with me to Revelation chapter 21, 
We're going to read verse 9 through 11. I'll put a lot of the, word, the words on the screen for you, but while we're over, in the, we're going to be in the last couple of chapters of Revelation several times a day. So just keep your, open up to Revelation 21 and keep your finger there or your whatever. Keep your Bible open there if you would. Revelation 21, beginning in verse 9, the last book of the Bible. There's only 22 chapters in Revelation, so here we are, the next to the last chapter in the entire Bible. Revelation 21, verse 9 says, Then one of the seven angels, who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues, came to me and talked with me, saying, this is, of course, John. He says, Come, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. So he says, Look, I'm going to show you Christ's bride. And he goes on, verse 10, And he carried me away in the Spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city. So he says, I'm going to show you the bride. And then he takes him in vision to a mountain and he shows him this great city. And he says, The holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. So the, the angel says, I'm going to show you the bride, almost with a, with, a, with a tone of pride here. He says, you know, look at her. Look at this bride. Isn't she beautiful? Isn't she perfect? Look at her. And it's not the case everywhere in all cultures, but in our culture, when a wedding takes place, the bride becomes the focus. And even for me, in the rehearsals and when the time when I spend with a with the bridegroom and, and the bride before the wedding, I always tell him, her wishes take trump, they trump your, your wishes. And I always tell any families that, because sometimes people will kind of start debating what's going to happen on rehearsal night. I always say, I'm going with what the bride says. And so, but the bride becomes the focus. And it's not, again, it's not like that in every culture. But the bride gets special attention at a wedding. And through this angel, but God begins to turn our attention, says, look at this bride. And you can almost picture in your mind, you can hear Mendelssohn's wedding march playing here. And of course, the lamb is referring to who? The lamb or the groom is who? It's Jesus, of course. And so the angel, it says, points out this heavenly city, New Jerusalem, this descending. And so the question that would naturally come to your mind and came to mind was, okay, if the bride is this city, so is Jesus marrying the city? And, of course, the answer to that is no. So who is the bride? A text you're very familiar with, Ephesians 5, verse 23, and uh, through... Uh, Maybe it's 31 and 32. It says, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Verse 32, This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So, again, often in Scripture we find when Christ is talking about the bride, he's talking about his church. So, Jesus is the groom, the church is his bride. And so, we're that bride. And so, uh, notice this from Adventist Home, page 26. It says, Christ honored the marriage relation by making it also a symbol of the union between Him and His redeemed ones. He Himself is the bridegroom. The bride is the church of which, as His chosen one, He says, Thou art all fair, my love. There is no spot in thee. So we, the church, are in the heavenly city when it's descending to the earth. And so when the angel points out the city and calls it Christ's bride, he's referring to the occupants of that city, which, of course, the redeemed, you and I, God willing. Revelation 21, if you're there, you should have your Bible open. We're going to look in verse 2 now. Revelation chapter 21, back up to verse 2. It says this, Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. So, again, here's that vision of this heavenly city, the bride, you and I. And he says he's prepared as a bride, adorned for the husband. And, you know, for us guys, we have, the truth of the matter is, we have very little to do with the preparations that take place for a wedding. In fact, I tried to find the statistics, and, and this year, as of, in 2020, 67% of wedding preparations fall on the bride. Only 14% do we as the groom take part in the preparations. 
means. There's the family members and others take part of the, of the other. But, but we usually do very little things in part of the planning other than, you know, their wives or the, 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 the uh, potential wife asks us, do you like this? We said, yeah, we like that. Go with that. That's about all we do. We do very little. But for a bride to get adorned, to get ready for the wedding, she has to put something on, right? The bride has to put on the wedding dress, a wedding garment. And she's not going to come out just dressed in her normal old clothes that she wears everywhere. She's not going to just come out in blue jeans and a t-shirt um, while her husband-to-be and all the rest of the guests are sitting there anxiously awaiting to see her. She's going to dress up the very best that she can when she presents herself to her future husband. She's going to get her hair Right? As perfect as she can. In fact, the average cost for the, for the brides to get their hair fixed is $110 to get their hair fixed. And another $100 is the average for them to get their makeup done for their wedding. So she's going to do all that she can to make sure all those blemishes are taken care of. She's going to make sure she smells just right. She's going to put on some nice perfume. Uh, she's going to get her nails done, maybe even a spray tan. Uh, but it takes a lot of time, a lot of preparation for the bride to get get ready. But if you think it takes a woman nowadays a long time to get dressed, uh, when Esther, queen, future, she became queen, when Esther was vying to be queen, look what the Bible says in Esther chapter 2 verse 12 and 13. This is how long it took her to get ready. It says, for thus were the days of their preparation apportioned, six months with oil of myrrh, six months with perfumes and preparations for beautifying women. Thus prepared, each young woman went in to the king. So they spent a year getting ready to meet the king just to see who was going to get to be the queen. So this is how long it took. So when we get impatient sometimes waiting an hour on a bride, think about that, right? <clears throat> anyway, a year's worth. But the, the bride... When she's getting prepared for a wedding, she's going to spend a lot of extra time in the dressing room. Just prior to the wedding, to, she's going to be looking in that mirror from different angles and trying to make sure everything about her is the very best that she can be. She doesn't want any flaws or spots or wrinkles or any blemishes when she presents herself to the groom. The main focus often is that dress. It's special. It's no ordinary dress. It's, it's a dress that will, will hopefully be, never be worn again once they wear it that once. It's something that has to be picked out. It has to be tried on. It has to be altered to fit that bride perfectly. From our scripture reading earlier, Revelation 19, verse 7, Keevan read to us, Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself, what? Ready. In preparation, the bride is getting ready. She's preparing herself to meet the groom. She's not just idling away her time as she expects the groom or the wedding day to be taking place. She's not just hoping she'll be ready when the time comes. She's actively doing everything in her power to be flawless, to be ready, to be able to present herself to her groom. And now verse 8, where Kevin read also earlier, says, And to her this bride was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. The Bible says that this fine linen, this perfect spotless uh, wedding garment is the righteous acts of the saints. And it also said in the verse 4 that the bride has made herself ready. And so for you and I to be ready for the coming of Jesus, for the groom, we have to be preparing now. Right now is the time for us to be preparing. We need to be doing all that we can. And to be the bride of Christ, you and I, we have to be doing this preparations. And I want to talk a little bit about how that's done. And, and we need a little bit of background to kind of understand where, where, this is, where, where we, we're coming from and where we're going. When you think all the way back to the beginning of the creation of man, of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, if you remember, they had on a perfect robe of righteousness. They had a perfect garment of light that covered all their nakedness, all their, if they, were, they were flawless, I guess, at that point, but it covered them up from, from uh, and so they, they, no, they didn't even know that they were naked, right? But after they sinned, and by the way, I need to make sure I add this, that robe was not something that they constructed, Right? That robe of light, that garment w w was given to them by Christ. They had nothing to do with putting that garment on. Jesus gave them that garment. 
And when they sinned, that robe was taken from them. And you know, they realized all of a sudden they were naked. And the Bible says they fashioned themselves garments with, from fig leaves. And so it was this garment of their own making. It was a garment they came up with themselves. And it was not sufficient. And, and, and there is no garment that we can fashion ourselves in any way that can cover our sins. That will nothing we can do, I want to make that clear, will be sufficient to prepare us to meet Jesus. When they sinned, they found themselves naked. They realized, as they had not before, that only God could cover them. They realized the enormity of what they had done at that point. Notice this, Christ's Object Lessons, page 311. It says, Only the covering which Christ himself has provided can make us meet to appear in God's presence. This covering, the robe of his own righteousness, Christ will put upon every repenting, believing soul. I counsel thee, he says, to buy of me white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. From Revelation chapter 3, verse 18. By the way, this, uh, all the quotes and texts that I have are uploaded. They're on our uh, website now if you want to go there and, and download these. But if we want to be prepared to meet the bridegroom, we have to have this robe, and we've got to understand it only comes from Jesus. We cannot have, we have no righteousness of our own. This is also in the bulletin, as well as on the quotes that I have. It says, This robe, woven in the loom of heaven, has in it not one thread of human devising. Christ in his humanity wrought out a perfect character, and this character he offers to impart to us. By his perfect obedience, he has made it possible uh, for every human being to obey God's commandments. When we submit ourselves to Christ, the heart is united with his heart. The will is merged in his will. The mind becomes one with his mind. The thoughts are brought into captivity to him. We live his life, and this is what it means to be clothed with the garment of his righteousness. Then, as the Lord looks upon us, he sees not the fig leaf garment, not the nakedness and deformity of sin, but his own robe of righteousness, which is perfect obedience to the law of Jehovah. That's what the robe of righteousness is. That's what the garment of salvation is. This is what this, this, this wedding garment that we have to be wearing when Jesus comes is. And so it's the robe of righteousness that's given to us when we submit ourselves to Jesus. When we surrender our lives to Him, when we ask Him to take control of me every day. It's a daily surrender that we have to make. And it's difficult. It continues to be a challenge because the, the greatest enemy that I have to fight and that you have to fight is ourselves. There's always self rising up to the top. And so there's a daily struggle to let Jesus be on the throne of our lives. But as we do that, as we make that submission to Jesus, our lives begin to come into conformity with God's Word and with His law, and our lives begin to be characterized by the fruit of His Spirit. And it's that fruit of God's Spirit that is the display of God's love in us. It's not something that we can fake. Look at Colossians chapter 3 with me, if you would. Chapter 3, verse 12 through 17. It says, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved put on, and it tells us what we need to be wearing. This is the, the, kind of a description of what it means to have that garment on. Put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. In verse 17, And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. The garments that Jesus wants his bride to be wearing is, is, is these outward manifestations and the inward transformation of his spirit and the fruits of his spirit being manifested in our lives. 
You know, on, on another day, I, I want to preach a sermon, and I, I was thinking about making this a three-part series, but I only have two weeks before we have that little seminar. But I want to do a, a sermon on the parable uh, of the wedding feast in Matthew 22. We're going to talk about it in a minute, just briefly. But there's one thing that's made clear when you read through Matthew chapter 22, beginning verse 1 through about verse 12, is that the Father is the one who provides that wedding garment. If you remember the story, he sends out the invitation to come to the wedding of his son. And look at Isaiah 61, verse 10. It says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. This robe comes from God. It comes from Jesus. This is the only place we can get it. And another thing that happens when two people are married is the bride customarily takes the name of the groom, right? That has been our custom. It's changed some nowadays. But to those who overcome and persevere until the wedding, Jesus is going to give us a new name. Notice, notice Revelation 2, verse 17. It says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give him some of the hidden manna to eat. I will give him a white stone, and on that stone, a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. So Jesus is going to give us a new name. We're going to take his name upon us at that point. And you know, when you try and think about a, a, a groom and his bride, and you think about what, what really is a, is a groom looking for in his bride, and one of those things, are, a couple of the things that we really prize and cherish about our bride is, is her love, her lovability, those sort of things, and her purity. Um, a man desires to find a woman who is loving and pure, a woman who has a pure heart and a pure life. And so it wouldn't be any surprise... To think that and define that that came from God. In fact, Desire of Ages, page 219, says, It's moral worth that God values. Love and purity are the attributes He prizes most. Those are the things that God is looking for in our lives. And of course, it's all uh, expanded in, into more detail as we look at the fruits of the Spirit. But this kind of sums it up. So Jesus is looking for a bride that has love and purity, just like we're talking about. God wants a people that is without spot and without blemish. And speaking of His church, Ephesians 5 verse 27 says that He might present it to Himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. I'm, temp I'm, I'm not going to go into a long s side trip here, but something is occurring to me now that... that um, I feel like I ought to mention something about. You know, years ago, the Christian church of any denomination talked about how we as believers should have transformed lives. There were things that, that from whatever denomination you were for, from, from the Baptists or the, uh, the Adventists or, the, or whatever it was, there were certain things you didn't do. There were certain things, certain places you didn't go. There were languages, you, a language you didn't use. There were, there were habits that you didn't have or you got rid of those things by the power of Jesus. But we don't hear that much anymore. Now it's just come to Jesus. And that's the first step. But it's not the last step. We come to Jesus, and He begins to transform us. And this is where we begin to put on this robe of Christ's righteousness. Look at 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2. It says, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. That's the picture that Jesus is looking for, a loving, a faithful, pure bride. And you know, when that wedding march begins, when you hear that music being played, when, when the cry, the bridegroom cometh, is given, you know, when the trumpet of God is blown, there's no time at that point for the bride, for us to rush into the dressing room and to try and put on their elaborate clothes that might, we might be wearing to the wedding. There's no time for the bride to get her hair done and her nails polished and all those kind of things. When the bridegroom arrives, we've got to have the wedding garments on already. In the parable that I mentioned to you earlier, Matthew 22, there's that story again about the, the wedding invitation, and, and God sends out the people to bring people to the wedding of His Son. And in verse 2, it says that, of course, that the wedding is for the Son of God. 
And in that story, and you know how it goes, there's a person there who does not have on the wedding garment. And God doesn't tell them when he goes to inspect them, and by the way, there's a very clear representation of the pre-advent judgment found in, in Matthew chapter 22 in that story. And people say, well, you don't find that in the New Testament. Yes, you do. But anyway, they're not told. When God sees these, this, this person that doesn't have the wedding garment on, he doesn't say, hey, listen, go slip into the room and slip it on now. He says, out of here. He says, you can't be a part of this. You've had plenty of time. You had plenty of warning. Uh, so he cast them out. To, and he says, there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth, it says. But the wedding garments are what separates the guests from the participants, from those who are going to be a part of the wedding. We've got to have on that beautiful garment of Jesus. We've got to have the characters of Christ when Jesus comes for his bride. You know, over the years as a pastor, one of the things that... Uh, I have found out by experience is that when I'm going to officiate at a wedding, you've got to have a rehearsal the night before or a couple, at least within just a few nights of when that wedding is going to take place. Because if you don't have that rehearsal, inevitably there's going to be some people who don't know where to line up and they're stumbling and there's fumbling around where the bridal party is standing or there's somebody that know what to do or when to say something. And it usually becomes a disaster. And it's a garment that we're talking about here. We've got to be wearing when Jesus comes. We've got to be preparing ahead of time. We've got to be a part of the rehearsing now. We can't wait until after he comes. It'll be too late. You know, I, I thought about, well, why didn't Jesus just go ahead and change our characters for us now and make it easy? Why didn't he just do that for us? Right? I mean, why doesn't he do that? I mean, why wouldn't he do it now so that we could be more effective witnesses for him until he comes? Why does he wait why does he wait? It's because we have to be developing those characters now while we're on earth. And one of the first quotes that we read, was, and it was so that we can bring glory to God. God wants to transform us through the, the, the circumstances and the situations. Did you hear that combination of those two words there? Um, in, in this earth and the, the things that we go through, he begins to, 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 to work out all the challenges that we have in our characters. He was trying to transform us into this image here. And you know, making a commitment to get married to someone can be very intimidating to some. Guys struggle with that more than women, or at least it used to be that way. And the thought of that kind of commitment, this lifetime commitment to one person, till Jesus comes or till you die, gives some people the jitters. I don't know if you have heard of this name or you remember this name, Jennifer Wilbanks. You might remember it when I show you this picture. She was the infamous, I don't know if you remember the story, the runaway bride. Three days before her wedding, uh, and I don't remember the, the year, I didn't uh, put it down in my notes, but she had, a, she had a wedding planned, and she had 600 guests. She had 28 people in the bridal party. There was 14 here and 14 there, all laid out. Three days before, she disappears. She goes to Mexico, or New Mexico, uh, gets on a bus and goes to New Mexico. And, and she uh, pretends that she's been abducted, by the way. And of course, it all comes to find out she just decided she didn't want to get wed and married. All the money, all the expenses that have been done. And sometimes when we feel and understand the commitment that Christ is asking us to make, if we want to be ready for heaven, if we want to put on that garment, maybe we, we, we kind of we want to back off a little bit. Or we're not ready to make that kind of commitment. Or we're not ready to make that kind of commitment now. And maybe we begin to think, well, this wedding thing, maybe this is not really what I'm after after all. Maybe I'm not ready to make this kind of commitment. I need to play the field a little bit more before I settle down, or whatever it is. But brothers and sisters, when we get serious about the wedding preparation, we will be willing to do anything for our spouse, right? You know, you think about it. Brides sometimes purchase those, and I didn't know this until I've been reading things for this, this, this sermon Brides sometimes purchase their dresses like a year in advance. I'm like, whoa, that is really preparing. 
And so sometimes I think as they get closer to the date, they find that maybe they've changed sizes from the dress that they bought. And so sometimes brides go on special diets to be ready for their wedding, right? Maybe there's a change in our diet that we need to make to be ready for the wedding. Some people have to change the way they handle their money. They realize that what's, what's mine is no longer just mine anymore. It's ours. And, and some people begin to see these things when they think about the kind of commitment that comes with a marriage. And they begin to think, I'm not sure. But this preparation process means that some have to change the way we spend our time. Uh, when you're single, we kind of did what we wanted to do. Uh, but marriage changes that. Now you've got other priorities, or we should have other priorities. Now we have a significant portion of our time is spent with the person that's becoming our spouse. The preparation process means that we have to commit to one person for the rest of our lives. Jesus said in Matthew 22, verse 37, He said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. It's a total, all-in, all-out commitment to Jesus. That's the only kind of commitment that Jesus accepts. When we think we're standing on the fence and we've got one, one foot in and, and one foot out, that's not acceptable to Jesus. It's, it's all in. That's the only way we're going to be ready for heaven. And it's a battle and a struggle every day. And it's, it's a commitment to, to spending time with Jesus. It's a commitment to exposing our things to holy things, to His Word, to coming to church, to, to uh, whatever it is, listening to the Bible, reading the Bible, exposing ourselves to Jesus to be ready. And you know, when you love somebody, you're willing to do for them and to sacrifice for them and to make the changes that are necessary. Isaiah 62 verse 5 says, For as a young man marrieth, a virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee. And as the bridegroom rejoiceth over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. Jesus is longing for his bride. Grooms anxiously await when that, for that bride to come down that aisle. And that's what Jesus is doing right now. He is anxiously waiting for his bride. Revelation 19.7 we read earlier, and Keevan read, The bride has made herself ready. Ready. Whenever um, I, I'm a part of a wedding ceremony, you know what the cue to begin is? It's when the bride is ready. You know, the, the groom and the grooms, and they're all ready, and usually the bride's maid are ready. But a lot of times, it takes the bride the longest to be ready. And nothing happens, nothing starts until the bride is ready. And so you can imagine how anxious Jesus is. How anxious he is to receive his bride. Revelation 19.7 says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to Him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come. The greatest thrill for the bride and the groom is to be with each other. And the question that we have to think about to examine to where we're at with Jesus and, and, and how we're feeling really about that, here in Revelation chapter 21, verse 3, if you want to look there, Revelation 21.3 says, and I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Do we really want to be with Jesus? Now we say as Seventh-day Adventists, Oh, I can't wait for Jesus to come. I can't wait for Jesus to come. But what, what, is, what is it that is so appealing for the coming of Jesus? to us? What makes it so appealing to us? Is it because we're going through so many troubles here on this earth? There's nothing wrong with wanting to get past the, struggle, the struggles and the trials and the tribulations that we experience here. There's nothing wrong with that. But at some point, in some way, we should come to the place, I think, that the, the most attractive part of heaven is Jesus. And for most of us, we got a ways to go. We, we, we're, all, we're all in the same boat to some degree. And you know, again, when you think about these weddings, traditionally, the father and the mother of the bride pays for the wedding. And it's the same with this, this situation with the bride, of, 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 with Jesus. The father paid the price. Out of love and commitment to you and I, the Father gave His only begotten Son. John 3.16, you know, the, the, the gospel in one verse. In the year 2019, 
couples spend an average of $35,329 on their wedding. That's the average. Uh, and it, of course, varies state by state. In New Jersey, listen to this, the average cost of the wedding was the highest in the nation. $51,287 was the average wedding cost in New Jersey. The average wedding cost, when you think about either of those figures or anywhere in between, is astronomical. But the cost that it cost heaven, the price that it cost heaven, is so much more inestimable than any of those figures, right? Jesus gave his life so that we could be a part of this wedding. Out of his commitment and his love to us, Jesus gave it all for us. Revelation 7, verse 13 and 14. <clears throat> says, One of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? This is John. He's in vision. And John sees these people in these white robes. And, and then this, this uh, angel is asking this rhetorical question to John. Because he's going to answer it as well. And he says, uh, What are these, or who are these, which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest... And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. That is how we get the robes of Christ's righteousness. It only comes through the sacrifice of Jesus. It only comes through the price that Jesus has paid for us. You know, uh, Jesus was the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. And when Adam and Eve lost that garment of righteousness, when they lost that in the beginning, and, and, and the, the, uh, Jesus had already prepared a way. A lamb had to be slain to make a garment to cover their nakedness and to pay for their sins. And of course, Jesus was that lamb. Brothers and sisters, I hear wedding music. Jesus is about to come. Now's the time that we've got to get ready. Are we making our preparation to be there? With outstretched arms and nail-scarred hands, Jesus is, gives us the invitation. He says, will you be my bride? Will you pledge? Stephan, you were in me, brother. Okay, all right. Will you be my bride, Jesus says, for better, for worse, in sickness and in health, till resurrection or his coming reunites us. Jesus has already pledged his love for you and I in 10,000 ways. And so he has taken his vows. And so now it's our turn. And so what I want to do is have a little wedding celebration here today. Maybe for you it's just going to be a recommitment service like we had here recently for Beth, wherever she, wherever she is back there, for her and Tim. Maybe it's just a reaffirmation of your vows. But what I want to ask you to do is, by your standing, you're not making a commitment, but I want to ask you to stand if you would now. If you would now, and if you can now, I ask you to stand. And church and others who are here with us today, um, I, before God and, and each other as our witnesses here this morning, will you here this day take Jesus for the first time as your bridegroom or maybe will you recommit this morning to him from this day forward to have and to hold for better or for worse till he comes again to love and to cherish and to be faithful to him until we're separated never separated from his presence if that's your desire please say I do I do Father this morning I want to pray for your spirit we many of us have made a commitment or a recommitment to you this morning. We acknowledge the cost that you paid at Calvary for us to be a part of this wedding preparation and this wedding celebration. And so we accept your invitation to be your bride this morning. And we're going to ask for your spirit to change us and to make us like you and to make us ready for your coming. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated.